So this weekend, I want us, as we are in part four of 40 Days of Prayer, I want us to look at the idea of praying in the fifth dimension. Praying in five different dimensions. Um, first, before we get into how to pray in five different dimensions, I need to give you a couple of really important review truths. Things that you already know, but you need to remind yourself of them. So why don't you write these down? These are the fundamental basis of all prayer. Number one is that God is a multi-dimensional God. God is a multi-dimensional God. Now I say that because the most important thing I can teach you about prayer, and that's what we're looking at now for weeks, uh, the most important thing I can teach you about prayer, your fulfillment in prayer and your fruitfulness in prayer will be dependent not on how much you know about prayer, but how much you know about God. The more you understand God, the better your prayers are going to be, the more effective they'll be, the more fulfilled they'll be, the more satisfying your prayer life will be. It's not about learning all about prayer, that's important, but more important than that is understanding God. And it starts with the fact that God is a multi-dimensional God. Now what do you mean by that? Well, it means that he has, he's not just one dimension. And you can see this in many different things. Why don't you write these down? First, we see this in God's creation. Obviously, you look around and the God who created a multi-dimensional world and universe is a multiple, multi-dimensional uh, creator. And so, there are dimensions that we know about, but there are some dimensions we don't even know about. The Bible talks about the spirit realm. We don't know about that. We don't see it, so we don't engage in it. Uh, but the Bible says this about creation, which we do see. Romans chapter one, verse 20. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and his divine nature have been clearly seen in what has been made so that men are without excuse. People say, well, what about all the people who've never read the Bible? Well, true, they haven't read the Bible, but you can learn a lot about God just by looking at nature. You don't, you don't have to have the Bible for a lot of things about it. For instance, we know that God likes variety. That's obvious. Look at nature. Uh, we know that God is organized. That's obvious. We know that God is creative. We know that God likes diversity. We know that God is powerful. When you look at thunder and lightning and earthquakes and you know storms of asteroids and all the different things in society and in the world, we know in the universe that God is creative and God is great and God is powerful. We learn a lot about God just in nature. So the Bible says we're without excuse. To me, it takes more faith to not believe in God than to believe in God. If I'm walking down a hillside and I see a little stone out of place, I might think that's an accident. But if I'm walking down a hillside and all of a sudden I see there on that field a Rolex just laying there, are you gonna believe that's an accident? That is evidence of design. Evidence of design. And a design must have a designer. You will say, well, God, you know, the world uh, or the universe was created with a big bang. That doesn't bother me. Wherever you got a big bang, you got to have a big banger. <laughs> Somebody had to pull the trigger. <clears throat> Not in a million years would you say that that, that uh, uh, watch just put itself together. And you could have trillions and trillions and gazillions of years and a watch is not going to form itself and all of a sudden start ticking on its own. That takes an enormous, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist, sorry. My answer is just as speculative as yours is, but it's a whole lot more reasonable than to just say it all just happened. It just happened. Look, have you ever seen the birth of a baby and how that baby comes together from a simple single cell and a zygote and then becomes you? There's so many things that say that God is a God of complexity. He's a God of complexity without even getting into the Bible. Job chapter 11, verse nine, seven to nine. Job and God are having a conversation and Job's kind of complaining about what went on in his life and 
God says, but wait a minute, I'm the creator, I'm in charge here. And he says, Job, let me ask you some questions. Can you fathom the limits and bounds of the greatness and power of God? The sky's no limit for God. We say the sky's the limit. Well, it's not a limit for God. But it lies beyond your reach. God knows the world of the dead. But you don't know it. In other words, there's a, there's a whole realm, there's a whole dimension you don't even know about. But God knows about it. God's greatness is broader than the earth and it's wider than the sea. So we know that God is a multidimensional God because creation shows the complexity that God created. And so we know that God had to be more complex than that. Now there's another way we see God's multidimensional nature and that is in Jesus' incarnation. In other words, when God came to earth and became a human being. Incarnation means God became flesh, the word became flesh. The Bible says in John chapter one, verse 14, the word became a human being and lived among us. And we saw his glory and he was full of grace and truth. The fact that God can be God and God can come to earth and be a human means he's multidimensional. He didn't have a problem. God had wanted to communicate to ants, he would have become an ant. If he wanted to communicate to cows, he would have become a cow. But God wanted to communicate to human beings, so he became one of us. That's multidimensional. The proof is in the fact of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says about Jesus, Hebrews 13, verse eight, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know anybody like that? Are you gonna be the same forever? You weren't the same you were last week. <laughs> you lost a few hairs and added a few wrinkles. And you're not the same. Now what is this saying? Jesus is neither bound by space nor time. Why? He's God. He's multidimensional. And the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter one, grace and peace to you from him, he's talking about Jesus, from him who is and who was and who is to come. Well that about includes everything. That certainly isn't describing you. It's not like you were, you are, and you will be. Jesus is multidimensional. God the Father is multidimensional. And then we actually see it in, in, in the Holy Spirit, number three. We see God is multidimensional and how the Holy Spirit moves. So we see it in the whole Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. John chapter three, verse eight, says this, Jesus is talking. He says, you know, the wind blows wherever it pleases. And you hear its sound, but you don't know where the wind comes from. You don't know where it's going. That's the way it is with everybody born of the Holy Spirit. You know what he's saying there? He's saying, you can't put the Holy Spirit in a box. You can't control him, he's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it's going. You can hear the sound. And he says, the, the Holy Spirit moves in dimensions we don't move in. You can't see the Holy Spirit, so clearly that's a dimension that we're not acquainted with. He's saying, the Holy Spirit is multidimensional. Job chapter nine, verse 10 and 11, he is talking about the Spirit. He does wonders that cannot be understood. For he does so many miracles, they cannot be counted. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When he passes me, I can't see him, and when he goes by me, I don't recognize him. I don't recognize him. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all multidimensional. Now, that's not a big revelation to you, you understand it. But here's the important point, number two. Because God is multidimensional, I'm never alone. I am never, never, ever alone. Because he's in every dimension at the same time. He's in the past, he's in the present, he's in the future. He's here, he's there. He's in heaven, he's on earth. He's in the spirit world, he's in your and my world. Here's what David says, Psalm 139. Where could I go to escape from you, God? <clears throat> Where could I ever get away from your presence? If I went up to heaven, you'd be there. If I lay down in the world of the dead, you'd be there. If I flew way beyond the east or lived at the farthest place of the west, you'd be there too to lead me. 
You'd be there too to help me. I could ask the darkness to hide me, but even darkness isn't dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Now, what does all this have to do with prayer? Well, it has a lot to do with prayer. I'm gonna take you to a different level today. I'm gonna talk to you about five dimensions of your life that you can pray about. And what I wanna do is explain them pretty quickly and then we're gonna actually practice them uh, in communion. Number one, first dimension. When I pray, first, I look backwards to the cross. I look backwards to the cross. And I'm talking about in a practical way, when I start my prayers, one of the things I start to do is not with my problems today or my fears about tomorrow, but I start with what I'm grateful for that happened in the past. It's good to start your prayers with the cross because it starts with an attitude of gratitude. It's a good place to start because it fills you with thanksgiving. When I think about Jesus Christ dying for me on the cross, it instantly reminds me of three things. I wrote them down there for you. How deeply God loves me, how costly evil and sin is, and how completely I'm forgiven. That's a good way to start your prayers. How much God loves you, and even though your sins were a mess, you're completely forgiven. So I look backwards to the cross. First Peter 1 says this, verse 18 and 19. God paid a ransom to save you. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life. Hmm. God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life and he paid for you with the precious lifeblood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. If you wanna know how much something is worth, whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. You might have some value possession in your home and you think it's worth this much. Let me tell you how much it's worth. Not what your dad told you not what you think, it's worth whatever anybody's willing to pay for it. If nobody's willing to pay for it, what, how much you want, it's not worth that, no matter how much you think it is. How much are you worth? Look at the cross. God sent his own son. He came to earth to die for you. The son of God became a son of man, so that the sons of men could be sons of God. He did what we could not do for ourselves. You couldn't pay for all the things you've done wrong, neither could I. So he said, I love him and I'll do it. And that shows how much you're worth. He gave his own self, his own son, to die for you. So when I pray, first thing I like to do is I like to think about how much Jesus loves me and how much I'm forgiven. I look back to the cross. Dimension number two. I look upward into my Father's loving face. That's the second thing I like to do when I pray. I start by thinking about the cross, and then I turn from the past backwards to looking upward into my heavenly Father's face. Now, the first thing you want to focus on is that God wants you to see him not as your dictator, not as your boss, not as your supervisor, not as your coach. When Jesus said, this is how you should pray, he said, you should call God Father. Father. We don't realize how radical that is because in the Old Testament, however, nobody called God Father. Maybe one or two times for thousands of years, God's called majestic, King of kings and Lord of lords, creator, and a lot of other really big terms. Only a couple people for thousands of years called God Father. And Jesus, one of the things he came to do is to explain what God's really like, and he says, God wants you to call him Father. Do you call God Father in prayer? God tells you to. How many times do you say, now Lord, now God, and what other, other terms you use? I want you this next week, every prayer you pray, start with Father. Why? It's the term God wants to be called. You say, well my father wasn't a very good father. Your God 
isn't your father and your father isn't your God. God is a perfect father, caring, close, considerate, consistent, capable, perfect. All, every other human father is imperfect, but God is the perfect loving father and he says, I want you to call me father. And when Jesus said, start every prayer with this, our father, he's serious about it. So this week, instead of praying, now Lord, now God, I want you to say, now Father. The way you see God will control your life more than any other thing in your life. The way you see God will determine, as I said, whether your prayers are fruitful and fulfilling or not. In Romans chapter eight, verse 15 to 17, it says this. Talking about prayer, it says, you, you should not act like cowering, fearful slaves. Like, oh man, if I go to God, I'm gonna get beat. You should not act like cowering, fearful slaves, since God's spirit has adopted you as children into God's family. That's what happens when you're saved. You get adopted into God's family. So you're now, you're now a child of God. You're in the family of God. You're adopted. So it says, instead, instead of being cowering and fearful, by his spirit, we simply cry out, Abba, Father. And God's spirit affirms that we really are his children. And since we are now God's children, we're also heirs with Christ, it means we're in the family, it means you're gonna inherit everything, and we will share both in his suffering and his glory. Now, this passage gives us three very important points about prayer you need to learn, memorize, and never forget, okay? Three ways God wants your prayers to be. If you wanna pray prayers that God likes to listen to, and if you wanna pray prayers that you get answers to, and if you pray prayers that you enjoy praying, it needs to have these three things. Number one, God wants my prayers to be personal. Write that down, personal. He says, when we come to God, we don't just call him Father, we call him Abba. Abba is the most basic root word in the Aramaic language which Jesus spoke. If you go to any Middle Eastern city right now and you see a little kid walking down the street, you hear him say, Abba, Abba, Abba. It's the word for daddy. It doesn't mean father, it doesn't mean dad, it means dada. In fact, it sounds like it, Abba. It's the easiest thing for a baby to pronounce, it's like Abba, dada. Papa. When my grandkids were born, they said, what do, what do you want them to call you? He said, Papa, why? Because they learned to say Papa before they could say father or mother. <laughs> Papa, Mama, Dada, Abba, Abba. It doesn't even mean Dad. It means Daddy. It's not the term of even like a five-year-old or a seven-year-old. This is the term of a baby, Papa, Dada, Abba. Jesus says that's how you address God. Oh, would that change the way you pray? That's the most intimate, God wants intimacy with you. He created you for intimacy. It's a baby term. He says when you come and pray, your prayers are not to be flowery and beautiful and erudite and cool. Your prayers are to be simple, childlike, unpretentious. Number two, he says it ought to be not only personal, it needs to be passionate. And he says when we pray, we cry out, Abba. Father. Notice, we simply cry out. Circle that. We simply cry out. You know, I, I've noticed that children cry a lot. They cry out a lot. In fact, they're not even embarrassed to cry in a mall <laughs> or in line at a store. They, they couldn't care less. If they're unhappy, they cry out. And they let everybody know. They are totally unpretentious. Are you that way in prayer? Are you more worried about what other people think about your prayer than actually talking to God? Your, your prayers are not gonna matter much as long as you're worried about what other people think of your prayer. 
He says, when you come, it needs to be personal, but it also needs to be passionate. Cry out. Put a little oomph into it. God, I have got to have this. God, I need you. Daddy, help me. I am being tempted like nothing else, Daddy. I need your help. And I'm going under. And I'm, I've got bills to pay. And I can't make the decision on what to do, whether I do I hold on or I let go. How do you know to do that? Do I accept job A or job B? And do I marry this or that or don't marry or whatever? And Daddy, I need your help. I, I need your help. Have you ever gotten emotional with God? God loves it when you share your emotion. Why? Because God is an emotional God. The only reason you have emotions is because God created you in his image. God shares emotions. The Bible says God gets angry, God gets frustrated, God gets jealous, God loves, God gets impatient. Why do you do that? Because you're made in his image. Personal passion. The third thing is it needs to be a partnership. Now, some of you, this is gonna be a big surprise for you. Did you know that when you pray, the Holy Spirit actually prays with you? Romans 8, 26. The Holy Spirit helps us with our weakness. We often don't even know how to pray as we should. Yeah, that's, anybody agree with that one? You know, somebody, I don't know what to pray, I don't know what to say. Okay? We often don't know what to say. We don't know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself speaks to God for us, even begs God on our behalf with deep groanings and feelings. He's passionate. The Holy Spirit's passionate about you. He even begs God on your behalf with groanings and feelings that words cannot, cannot express. Okay, now what in the world does that mean? Okay, let's first cover a couple things. Your loving Heavenly Father understands that you often don't know how to pray. Your loving Heavenly Father understands that you often don't know what to say. Your loving Heavenly Father understands that you often don't even know how to say it. You can't put it any, into words. Any parent understands that. When my kids were little and they would come to me and they would try to say something and they couldn't even put it into words themselves, but I knew what they meant. And as their loving father, I knew even though they couldn't even say, they, they didn't know what they were talking about, I knew what they were talking about. They didn't know what they're feeling, I knew what they're feeling. I knew the answer before they even made the request. That's called being a dad. And then the Bible says that God joins with you and talks to himself when you talk to him. You go, is that a little weird? God prays to God. Oh, come on. You never talk to yourself? <laughs> you do it all the time. Let me ask this. How many times is somebody talking to you and while they're talking to you, you're talking to yourself about them? How often does that happen? All the time! <laughs> Why? You're made in the image of God. And while you're talking to God, God can talk to himself about you. Okay, number three. I look inward, this third dimension, I look inward when I pray to Jesus living inside of me. Did you know that Jesus is in you? When you become a Christian, when you step across the line, he puts his spirit in you. Jesus is in you. Well, for that matter, I don't, this may shock you, the Trinity is in you. Because you don't get God piecemeal. When you got Jesus, you got the Holy Spirit. When you got the Holy Spirit, you got the Father. The Trinity is inside you. You say, well, that's a dimension I don't understand, I don't even feel. Got it. But it's the reality whether you feel it or not. The Trinity is in you. You might write this down. All three in me. The Father is in you. The Spirit is in you. The Son is in you. If you have invited them in. Now if you haven't invited them in, they're not in you. But that's what salvation's all about. And so I look inward 
to Jesus living inside of me. Because Jesus isn't just in heaven. I said he's multidimensional. He's everywhere, including in you. Now, since Jesus is in me, and the Father and the Spirit, and I know that I'm unconditionally accepted by my Father, it gives me the freedom and it gives me the courage to honestly face up to my faults. And the third part of prayer, I, I've turned from the cross to the Father to now what's inside me. Christ, you're in me, but there's some stuff in me that's in there with you that I don't like. There's some bad attitudes. There's some secret sins. There's some compulsions. There's some fears. There's some hurtful memories. There's some resentful thoughts. There's some unforgiveness. God, there's some stuff in me. That I don't even know how to clear it all out, and it's in there with you. And so I'm gonna ask you to help me do some house cleaning. And this is a third part of prayer. 2 Corinthians 13, verse five. Examine yourself it's self-examination. Do a heart checkup. Examine yourself to see if your faith is real and growing. Test yourself. Remember that Jesus is living in you. Of course, unless you failed your test and you've never asked him in. Now, let me ask a question. Would anybody here besides me like to be better than they really are? I, I, of course you do. This, I love you so much for this. This is why you're here. You want to be better. You want to be better than you are. Well, I can't get any better until I face what needs to be challenged and changed. And, and, and so before I can get better, I got to admit what's bitter, what's bad. I got, I got to, you see, <laughs> The truth will set you free, but first it makes you miserable. Because the truth you like the least is the truth about you. The truth I like the least is the truth about me. And I don't, I don't want to be honest to myself, much less anybody else. But I can't change, I can't grow until I'm honest. There is no change without trust, and there is no trust without truth. And so, first I have to be honest. Well, it starts with I look into the face of my loving Father, I know he's gonna accept me no matter, he already knows all the gunk and the junk that's in my life. And knowing that he already accepts me unconditionally means he's already inside of me, so he knows what's everything inside of me. So I can now be honest to God. This is the third dimension. I look inward to Jesus living in me, and then I ask Jesus living in me to help me do a little house cleaning of the junk in my life. Proverbs 28, 13 says this, up here on the screen. If you try to hide your sins, you'll never succeed. But <clears throat> if you humbly confess and reject them, you will receive mercy. I love the Living Bible says you get another chance. Ask any politician, they'll always tell you the cover-up's worse than the sin. In this third dimension of I pray and I ask God for helping me as I look within, where do you start? Well, you might start with the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that's a good verse to write down. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 are called the nine fruit of the Spirit. And it says the fruit of the Spirit are these things, love, joy, peace, Patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, self-control. I'd like all those things in my life. I'd like to be more loving, more joyful, more peaceful, more patient. I'd like to be more self-controlled. There's not a thing on that list I don't want. What is that? It's a perfect picture of Jesus. And so you say, Jesus, you're in me. Show me what needs to change and start producing some fruit in my life today. Help me to be a little bit more loving today, a little more joyful today, a little more at peace, a little more patient. And every day, that can be a godly checklist because it's just a picture of Jesus. Jesus produced some, some fruit in me today. Okay, number four. I, I did a backward look at the cross, I did an upward look at the Father's face, I do an inward look at Christ in me. Then number four, uh, fourth dimension, I look around. 
and I ask the Holy Spirit to use me. This is the fourth dimension of prayer. And I like to do this, and I just say, uh, you've heard me say this many times, the, the most dangerous prayer you can pray is just two words, use me. I dare you to pray that prayer and mean it. Because if you get usable, God will wear you out. The world is waiting. So you just take the fourth look, you look around and, and you look at the world around you and you say, Holy Spirit, show me where you wanna use me today. And instead of criticizing the world or complaining about the world or judging the world, that doesn't work, um, or whining about the world or for heaven's sake, blogging about what's wrong with the world, Why don't you just say, Holy Spirit, show me what's wrong and show me how I can make a difference. Use me. I dare you to pray that prayer. That's the fourth dimension prayer. Romans 6, verse 13. Give yourself completely to God, every part of you, since you've been given a new life and you want to be used. There's nothing like it. You want to be used as a tool in the hands of God, used for his good purposes. That's a purpose-driven life right there. God, use me the way you wanna use me. Use me any way you wanna use me. I don't know who I'm supposed to say this to, but somebody here listening, the world is waiting for your contribution. I don't know what it is. But we live in a world that desperately needs your help. And the world is waiting for your, I'm making my contribution, are you? You were made for more. You were made for more. And you need to pray the fourth dimension prayer. God, use me. I don't even know where, but look around. When you find a need and you have an interest or you got an ability, guess what? Those things fit. Backwards to the cross, upwards to the Father, inward for examination and to communicate with Christ in me. And then around me at the world and go, Lord, where can you use me today? Stop trying to do something great. Stop trying to do something great with your life. Just do normal things with a great amount of love. And God will bless that. By the way, I didn't think that one up. That's from Mother Teresa. You know, don't, you know, stop trying to find some significant place to serve. Make what you're doing significant because you're pouring your heart into it and God will notice. That's the fourth dimension. The world's waiting for your contribution. The world needs your help. And by the way, the best launch pad is your church family because we'll give you the support here. You need to go retake class 301 again. Go take it again with a new set of eyes and say, God, use me. Finally, there's the fifth dimension. And it is this. I look forward. I look forward to my future in faith. I look forward to my future in faith. And now, in my prayer, I, I've looked at the past, I've looked up, I've looked within, I've looked around, and now I'm looking forward. Now's the time to talk to God about my schedule today. This week, this month, this year, the next 10 years, my 20 year plan, my life goal. Now, talk to God, Abba, Daddy, Papa. This is stuff God wants you to talk about. Any parent loves to hear their child talk about their dreams. Any good parent. God wants to hear your, your plans, your thoughts, your ideas, your dreams. You talk to your father about the day ahead of you. And you say some stuff like, Father, Abba, would you help me prioritize? I got 19 things to do today. I'm not gonna get them all done. Help me to prioritize. Show me what matters most. Father, help me to make the right decisions in the right way. Father, help me to have the energy. Help me to know who I should contact, who's got the wisdom that can help me pull this off. 
Lord, I'm going into a meeting. What should I say? Father, help me to have a tough skin and a tender heart. Help me to be tender without surrender. You know, you can read a lot of self-help books that talk about one of the common suggestions for people in personal development is you should build a, a mastermind council. A, a, a personal mastermind council that coach your, your life. Well, that's not a bad idea, I'm not against that. But I, can I recommend some members? How about the Trinity? <laughs> Put the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit on your mastermind council, you'll make a whole lot fewer mistakes. And you say, come on, Rick. How do they coach? Oh, they have an incredible foolproof manual. <laughs> and it's all been written out. You just have to read it. The more you use this book, the more confident you're gonna be in life. Besides, ultimately, as God's child, your father has already rigged the system. Did you know this? You're not gonna get everything you want in life. I'm not telling you that at all. But I'm telling you this, what God wired you for and made you for and wants you to, to accomplish what he wants you to be in your life, it's already been wired. Look at this next verse. Philippians 1, 6. I am confident of this, that God who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. You can go to the bank with that one, folks. Now this, five-dimensional praying, it's just another way. Now I'm just giving you another way to freshen up your prayer life. But you know that the five things I just shared with you are all brought to us in remembrance in communion. And we're going to close by taking communion right now. Inside your program, I want you to pull this out. There's a communion guide. And I wrote this out for you, not because I'm gonna to try to teach all that I could teach on that, but I want you to take it home with you. I'm gonna give you the fill-ins. I'm gonna give you the fill-ins right now because you can take communion in your small group. And when you do, here's a good guide for it. But everything I just taught you is also on that list right there. Jesus gave us a tool to remember these five dimensions. It's called the Lord's Supper. It's called communion. It's called the Eucharist. We're gonna take it together now. Take out that guide that I've prepared for you. And the first question I wanna ask is, what is the purpose? You know about communion. If you've grown up in a church or you've ever been to a church, you know people take the symbols of wine and bread or juice and bread as the symbols of the body and blood of Christ. When Jesus transformed the Passover into the Lord's Supper, he announced the reason, the purpose for it, twice. He says, do this to remember me. This is a reminder, communion is a reminder to What we're gonna do now in the last five minutes is take a visible symbol of everything I just taught you. I wanna show it to you. It's a, it's a reminder of a memory tool. What specifically are we to remember? Well, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul explains that communion teaches us five very important truths. Guess which one they are. I just taught them to you. First, he says communion reminds us to check our hearts. That's the third dimension of prayer. Notice there that verse, 1 Corinthians 11. Paul is talking to the people in Corinth, the church of Corinth, and he's talking about the Lord's Supper, and he says this. Pay attention. If anyone eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that person is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That's a big deal. This is why, notice, you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking from the cup. Third dimension. We just talked about that. You should examine yourself. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without recognizing, in other words, committing to, the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment on yourself. Whoa! This is not something light. That's why many of you are weak or sick, and some even died. So there are consequences. 
But if we examine, if we examine and judge ourselves, we're not gonna be judged by God, good news. Now, this says we are not to take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We're not, none of us are worthy of the Lord's Supper. It's all by God's grace. But he's saying it's only for those who've accepted the gift of Christ's salvation. If you haven't accepted Christ in your life, please do not take the Lord's Supper because it's worse off for you, not better. It has no meaning, has no power. In fact, it's wrong for you to take the symbols of Jesus dying for you and then rejecting Jesus dying for you. You say, well, I'm not sure if I've ever really accepted. Then we will, we will confirm that in just a second. All right? He says, examine ourselves and judge each ourselves, then we won't be judged by God. Let me give you a chip. Memorize Psalm 139, 23, and 24 so that in the Lord's Supper or on a daily basis, you can pray this prayer. Look up here on the screen. Here's what it is. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. And see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So first, communion reminds us to check our hearts. We're gonna do that in just a second. But then communion reminds us of the five transforming truths we just talked about. So fill this in. We'll write them. I'm not gonna teach you on this, but I will read the verses. Number one, five great truths that we learn from communion. No one loves us more than our Father our Heavenly Father. We just talked about that in detail. Nobody loves us more than our Father in Heaven, and the cross proves it. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In other words, it's a memory tool. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. I've written a couple questions I want you to consider later on this week. When, in other words, the time of the day of the situation, when am I most likely to forget how much my Heavenly Father loves me? You need to know. Is it Friday nights? Is it Monday morning? Is it in a certain tempting situation? When am I most likely to forget how much my heavenly Father loves me? How about this question? What sin or sins do I habitually fall into when I forget God's love for me? You realize that's a source of everything that happens wrong in your life. We always get into trouble when we doubt God's love. He says, God loves you. Now there's a second great truth. And it's this, we belong to each other in God's family. Communion says not only does God love me more than I will ever understand, that's the cross, but we belong to each other in God's family. That's why we take communion. Now in Corinth, there were three big problems in that church and it was ruining the Lord's Supper. And, and when Paul is writing this to these people, he says, you got three problems, guys. Number one, you got members in your church with unresolved conflict, and you're not right with each other. He said, how can you have a happy church? How can you have a harmonious family? How can you have unity and harmony when you have people in the church arguing with each other? They're disagreeing, they're taking sides, they're even fighting with each other, that's a problem. He said, the second problem you got is you're acting like the Lord's Supper is just for individuals. Everybody, please look up here. The Lord's Supper is not for individuals. Now, once in Scripture does it ever say, take the Lord's Supper on your own? Not once. Why do you think they call it communion? It's communal, it's community. It is only to be taken with other people. Never in Scripture are you ever ever commanded to take the Lord's Supper in your How can you have communion by yourself? It is the symbol that we're part of the body of Christ. You can take it in a small group. The Bible says where two or three people are. That's community. But nowhere in scriptures it says take the Lord's Supper on your own. Not once. There may be people who do it, but it's not in the Bible. 
In this church, we teach what the Bible says. They're acting like the Lord's Supper was for individuals, and it's not shocking to you. Not a single time in the Bible does it ever say take communion on your own. You're part of a body, and communion actually says you're part of a body. That's why we take it with each other. The third problem in this church was that they were oblivious to the needs of other people in their own family, and there were some really rich people and some really poor people, and they weren't taking care of each other, and there were some people who were coming and eating, and other people were hungry. Here's what he says. 1 Corinthians 11, I hear that there are divisions among you when you meet as a church. So when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you're eating, because as you eat it, each one of you goes ahead without waiting on anybody else. And then he says here, you know, one member goes hungry while another gets drunk. Obviously they didn't have to celebrate recovery in that church. By the way, notice something here. It says, when you meet as a church, circle the word meet. And it says, when you come together, you can't have church without meeting. You can't have church without coming together. There's, oh, I'm a part of the church. Where do you meet? I don't meet anywhere. When, where do you come together? I don't come. Then you're not a part of a church. Church means you have to come together. You have to, you have to meet. You meet as a church when you come together. It says, not the Lord's Supper. It says, uh, uh, so, here's some questions to ask yourself. What issue or issues have I made more important than being in harmony and unity with my brothers and sisters and God's family? When you come to church, it should be harmony and unity. Not politics, which divides. Not a lot of other stuff, which divides. What issue has become more important to me than my fellow Christians? Only God can tell you that. Would God be pleased where your loyalty has been? 1 Corinthians eleven thirty three. 33. So dear brothers and sisters, when you gather at the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. Now there's a larger principle here. He says the church should be the one place where we put each other's needs ahead of our own. Can I give any example where I've put the needs of my brothers and sisters in my church family ahead of my own? Can I give any example? Do I know of anybody in our church in need? We say, well, I don't know any. Well, talk to me. The third great truth, Lord's Supper teaches us God loves me completely. We belong to each other in God's family. The third thing is that the Spirit of Jesus lives inside of me. The Spirit of Jesus lives inside of me. That's what communion says. In John 6, 56, 57, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood live in me and I live in them. Remember, it's a symbol, in remembrance of me. The living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. Question, what happens when I forget this fact? When I forget that Christ lives in me? Number four, fourth big truth. Neither the five dimensions. This life is not the end of the story. Did you know the communion teaches that? This life is not the end of the story. John 6, Jesus said, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. But those who do eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. This is not the end of the story. There's more to life than just here and now. So am I using my time? Am I using my money? as if that's all, all that matters is this life. Am I investing anything in the next life where I'm gonna spend eternity? What would I change if I kept reminding myself to ask, how long is this gonna last? Friends, I'm giving you some really tough questions and I hope you're not gonna throw them away. I hope you're not gonna lay them aside. I hope you'll ask yourself these in your prayer time. The fifth thing we get from the Lord's Supper is this. Jesus is coming back one day to judge and reward. Jesus is going to come back one day to judge and reward. And Paul tells us in verse 26, every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death, that's past, until he comes again, that's in the future. There's a past look, there's a present look and there's a forward look in communion. What's that called? Multidimensional. 
I'm gonna ask the ushers to come forward right now and serve. We're gonna wait till everybody's been served after you just read that. And we're gonna take the Lord's Supper together, reminding ourselves of these truths. That Christ died for us and it shows how much God loves us. That we belong to each other in God's family. That the spirit of Jesus lives inside of you. That this life is not the end of the story. And then one day, Jesus is coming back. And when he does, he will judge and he will reward. I want us to sing while we're serving. We'll wait till everybody's been served and we'll take together.